Anyways, I, I want to turn over to Amos 3. I don't want to waste time. Turn over to Amos 3. I, uh, I, I changed my message uh, 30 minutes before uh, leaving to come here. And I don't recommend you doing that. I don't recommend you as a preacher doing that. Uh, Brother Randy Gorski, uh, he, goes, uh, he goes, you're going to have to change your message after dealing with us all day. And he is my chauffeur. And uh, I need a new chauffeur. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but... Uh, but I, I felt the Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm a, if you know me, I like to prepare. I, I'm a, I'm a, I, I believe in preparation. I believe the horse is prepared unto the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. And uh, I've been planning since your pastor called me months ago. I've been plan- as soon as he called me, I thought, what am I going to preach? And uh, I, I've thought about it. Uh, every now and again, it'll come up on my heart. And I had a message, my favorite message. I was going to preach it tonight. It's called In the Beginning, out of Genesis chapter 3. And um, I had it ready. And uh, the Lord laid something on my heart while we were driving around today. And... Uh, and my burden changed. And I'd rather preach a message than a sermon. That's good, and what I believe I have tonight is I believe I have a message. Um, I've preached this message before. I've preached in other places. I promise this ain't the first time. Amen. Some of you are looking like, oh no, what are we going to get? Uh, but I believe sometimes the Lord does this to me. He, I believe he, does, he has me changed last minute. And I believe he does it to test me. And he says, Aaron, are you going to do what you plan to do? Or are you going to change whenever I tell you to change? And uh, sometimes he does it to test my faith. Like Brother said, he said, at the end of the day, any message you preach, you're taking it by faith. That's what God wants you to preach. And, and I'll tell you this, I really didn't know why he wanted me to preach it until you got up and preached that. And uh, I, prayed for, I prayed for four things uh, while I was here, and I wrote them down. I, out of this meeting, I wanted, number one, God to increase my faith and my confidence in my ministry that God's given me to do. I wanted that. I wanted to increase my faith and confidence. Uh, number two, I wanted to uh, enjoy myself. You say, Aaron, you wrote that down? Yeah. I said, God, I want to relax and enjoy myself out here. So far, he's answered both of those prayer requests. The third thing is I wanted to pray for my mother-in-law and my wife. You say, Aaron, why? Uh, my mother-in-law's in the hospital right now. Uh, COVID, lungs, pneumonia, she has COPD, and, uh, but she's getting out tomorrow. Glory to God, no oxygen. Amen, nothing like that. And so God answered that prayer. He's comforted my wife. He's got my mother-in-law. She's feeling better, so glory to God. And then I prayed fourthly to be a blessing to both God and man. I want to be a blessing to you all, and I want to be a blessing to God. And I believe God's answered that, that prayer request already. I hope He has. And then He put something on my heart last night, because I, I got to looking over this list, and I said, well, God, you've already answered all four of my prayer requests. <laughs> And I said, God, would you give me another one? And this one came to my heart. I said, I, I want someone out of this meeting to surrender to salvation or to service. Amen. Specifically to preaching. That's my fifth prayer request. Amen. We'll see if the Lord answers that one tonight. Amos chapter number 3. Amos chapter number 3. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. God's telling them how much He loves them and how much they mean to Him and how close they are to Him. He says, Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. He said, Because I love you, I'm going to punish you. Can two walk together except they be agreed? He's going to ask questions here in verses 3 through down through uh, 8, and they're all rhetorical questions. They all mean no. The answer to all of them is no. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No. They're about to part ways. Will a lion roar in the wilderness when he hath no prey? No, he's going to stalk quietly until he has prey. Will a young lion cry out of his den if he hath taken nothing? No, he's going to be sad. Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? No, there's no snare there. Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? No, you won't take up the trap until the bird's caught or the animal's caught. Verse 6, shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? No, a trumpet means that they're under attack. Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? Brother uh, Knowles preached that the other night, or mentioned that the other night. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto the pro- uh, his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord hath spoken, who can but prophesy? He's saying this up to this point, he's saying, God's roared. He said, do you think God's roaring for no reason? He's saying, do you, are, do you think God's roaring because he hasn't already taken his prey? He's saying, do you, do you not understand that God is roaring not because judgment is coming, but because judgment is here? That's what he's saying. It goes along with what we talked about last night. Publish in the palaces at Ashdod and in the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria and behold the great tumults in the midst thereof and the oppressed in the midst thereof. For they know not to do right, saith the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, an adversary shall be uh, even round about the land, and he shall bring down thy strength from thee, and thy palaces shall be spoiled. 
Thus saith the Lord, as a shepherd uh, taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out of them that dwell in Samaria in the corner of the bed, and in Damascus in a couch. Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob, saith the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day that I will visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. And I will smite the winter houses with a summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. And God, I'm asking you, Lord, just for these next few minutes, God, to get me out of the way, Lord, to God speak to your people. And uh, Lord, what was already preached, Lord, I pray it goes along with it, God. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to hear the message, Lord, this afternoon, God, and not be distracted, God. For these next few minutes, God, arrest, Lord, the attention of every listener, God, through the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray, God, conviction would be hot, Lord, but I pray, God, there'd be hope. I pray there'd be direction. I pray there'd be leading, God. And I pray, Lord, something that would happen in these next few minutes, God, would be life-altering, Lord. And, God, if it be life-altering, Lord, I pray it would alter the church, Lord, that that life is in. I pray it would alter the family that that life is in. And, God, I pray it would alter that community, Lord, that that life is in. Like the pastor just prayed, God, that our churches would get help, Lord, through this message, God. I ask you, Lord, to bless it in Jesus Christ's name and amen. Amen. Amos here is 40 years after Elisha, and if you study out the life of Elisha, it's around 40 years after, and uh, not much has, uh, much has changed since Elisha was alive. Assyria is a new superpower. Uh, Egypt at this time is kind, and they're kind of sticking to themselves, but Assyria is lusting after power and killing and torturing, and I don't want to go through everything the Assyrians did, but they are wicked, un- ungodly people. They used to torture their, 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 the people they took there in war. They would take them in bondage. They'd put hooks through their nose and through the bottom of their jaws, and uh, they, they'd put a rope through that, and they'd lead them along through the deserts that way uh, uh, to transfer from place to the other. They'd cut off hands, feet, ears, tongues, uh, cut eyes out. They'd skin you alive. They'd hang you on trees. They'd, uh, the, they'd place... Uh, the heads of their prisoners at the the palace gates that they had. And Amos is preaching to a generation of God's people who up to this point, they don't don't really know a lot about defeat. This generation specifically. Up to this point, they've had pretty secure borders. Up to this point, their country has been flourishing. And right now, the children of Israel, they've made a big transition. They're they're gone from a rural farming uh, community or a, a nation to more of a city dwelling. Urban style, lifestyle. Uh, they went from fighting farmers to citified, culture, sophisticated, proud, wise, and worldly wisdom. They went from agricultural society to urban dwellers. Notice in verse 15, they have multiple houses to escape winter's cold and summer's heat. Doesn't this sound an awful lot like a country that you know? They have multiple houses, places to go. Amos, just so you know, he's from the country. He's a country boy. I mean, you can find out through study, studying his life. And he sees how all they, these people are living. What it is is Amos, all that he knows is hard work. All that he knows is just how to work out in the fields and he's just a gather of sycamore fruit. And all that he knows is a hard, rough lifestyle. And God has him go to this sophisticated crowd and preach to them. You may have felt like that throughout your ministry. He has an old country boy. God might just send you somebody that maybe you don't like or maybe you don't respect. He may just send you with somebody from Appalachia to preach to you. Amen. Yeah. The sister today asked me, she goes, do you like Mountain Dew because you're from Appalachia? I said, no, I like Mountain Dew because there's a bunch of sugar in it. It gets me hyped up. (laughs) Praise the Lord. If you can't get the Holy Ghost in it, drink a bunch of caffeine before, amen, it'll help you. (laughs) What it is, is he sees, sees, he's, he's he's been working his whole life, and he goes to a group of people, and he says, hey, you're just kind of taking it easy in Zion. You've got all the blessings of God and God's been good to your nation, but you've gotten to a place where you've gotten just a life of comfort and a life of ease. And folks, there's a lot of people, young and old, sitting inside of our churches that are living a life of ease. They're eating from the scriptures because their Bible-believing preacher knows the Word of God and feeds them, feeds them, feeds them, and they're spiritual gluttons. They won't put it to work what they're, what they're learning. They're not going to exercise their faith. But man, they'll just gobble it up. And they'll gobble up the YouTube videos. And they'll gobble up all the teaching. And they'll gobble up all the preaching. And they just sit there and they don't do anything with it. I'm not targeting anybody tonight, but I'm not an old man. So I, I try not to, I don't, I don't really preach to old men. But I know this, I'm a young man. So I at least preach to the young people. There's a lot of young people just living man in ease. Wanting to make a life for themselves, wanting to make a life for their their marriage, whatever it is, work a job, get a new car, get a house, man, go to college. And they say, God, I'm going to put you on the back burner. His illustrations are wild bees, storms, animals, and nature. You know what he calls them all in chapter 4, verse 1? He calls them all kind. You know what a kind is? 
It's a big fat cow. Amen. I'm not going to call you a big fat cow, but Amos did. Brother Amos did. <laughs> My point is this, is that they've been so accustomed to their lifestyle and the long-suffering of God, they've mistaken the long-suffering of God for thinking that God's all right with the way that they're living. And a lot of God's people think that because God hasn't carried out judgment on them, that He's all right with the way that they're living. But Amos is here to tell them, hey, God is wanting something more from His people. People usually don't take the advantage of the long-suffering of God. God will let you sit there for a while and ease. He'll let you sit there in comfort. But at some point in time, He's going to say, Hey, you've got to start doing something with what blessings I've given you. Right. So notice number one, there, His message on sin. And I want to focus just on this verse here, verse number 12. As a shepherd out of the mouth of the lion... Uh, notice, thus saith the Lord, As a shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear... I got to reading that text one day and I heard someone uh, mention something about it, a preacher, and I got to uh, thinking about it. Uh, that sheep, just, just two leg, two, uh, uh, the left leg, uh, is uh, all that's left is two legs and a piece of an ear. You know, that's not much. That's not much left. I call that bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. And then that title of the message is Bits and Pieces. Bits and Pieces. How did the lion get the sheep? I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to get to the end. How, how, uh, that's where you want to get to, amen. You always want to get to the end, amen. That's the goal. <clears throat> a lot of men never get there, amen. Uh, how did the lion get the sheep? Lions, go, uh, lions always go after the sheep that is wandering or astray from the fold. Sheep wander away when they're not paying attention and thinks everything's all right. Sheep wander away that are stubborn and do not want to follow the shepherd or be around the other sheep. You want to know how you and I can wander? We can wander in our prayer lives. We can wander in our zeal for God. We can wander in our thankfulness. We can wander away from God in our priorities and get our priorities out of whack. We can wander away from God in our service to Him. We can wander away from God in our friendships, have friendships with the wrong people. We can run, uh, wander away from God in our mentality, how we think about things, how we see things. We can wander away from God spiritually. And the shepherd will use his rod to discipline a wandering sheep. Uh, you, you know where there in Psalm 23 it says, Thy rod, thy comforteth me. Uh, rods are used for all different kinds of things. Uh, I wrote it down there. Uh, it's all throughout the Bible. Rods are used for uh, counting, chastising, checking, collecting, comforting, communion, and correcting. They're used for all different kinds of things rods are. But one thing that they're used for is disciplining the sheep. Now that rod would be around 18 inches long, uh, depending on how big the shepherd was. And he would carry that in his dominant hand. And that rod is a picture. It's an extension of his power. You saying, what do you mean? Uh, how many of y'all had a dad that believed, um, spare not the rod? I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on, on YouTube, but y'all, y'all, okay. I don't know how your dad did it, but my dad, sometimes he'd use, he'd use a rod. And uh, I knew who was in power whenever he was holding that rod. I knew who was making, calling all the shots. It wasn't me. It was him. He held all the power. And if that sheep was wandering or uh, astray or going away, what that shepherd could do is he could swoosh, swoosh, take it and swing it. And, and he'd make that sound. That shepherd would jump back. He'd jump back and he'd come back. to He knows he's doing wrong. He could just swipe it through the air if he had to. What he could also do is, is if he didn't want to go away to the sheep or it was a, a state of emergency, he could take that rod and he could just throw it over there by that sheep. And when that sheep saw that rod, he knew what that rod meant. He'd run away. He could throw it. And then if he had to, he could obviously beat the sheep. He could do other things with it. He would also use that rod to check underneath of its fur or underneath of its coat and see if it was infected with anything. But uh, he'd use it for different things. He'd also use that rod to count the sheep and spread them out. But he would whittle that rod down to where it was nice and smooth. Because whenever he would go to beat that sheep, he didn't want it to pull back any flesh. Because see, if that sheep begins to bleed, it could get infected. Get this, now get this. The shepherd's goal wasn't just to mutilate the sheep. He was going to correct it, but he wanted to do it in a way where that sheep could still be healthy, that sheep could still grow, he could still bounce back from it, he could still be happy. Right. Folks, God knows how to correct you and I. Amen. And I don't know about you, man, but I'm thankful that when God goes to correct me, He doesn't abuse me. He doesn't, just, he doesn't just zap me, man, with His power. God has a way, man, to just discipline me. And He says, Aaron, I don't like what you did, but He does not destroy me. Yeah. God knows how to chastise you and me. He can chastise us physically, mentally, financially, psychologically, in our relationships, emotionally, whenever we wander away from Him. If a sheep continues to go astray, eventually the shepherd may kill the sheep. 
Um, or he may use it uh, for something else. Uh, Psalms 23 there, uh, sometimes he just, the sheep continues to go astray. The sheep continues to go astray. It continues to not listen. It continues to disobey. And it'll start leading other sheep astray. And the shepherd cannot, he can't have the other sheep going astray. So what he has to do is he has to take that one that's being a problem, being a cancer, and he has to get rid of it. And you know what sometimes I found out some shepherds do? You know Psalms 23 over there says, The Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. What some shepherds would do is they take that sheep and they'd have to kill it. And what they'd do is they put it in a bag, in a knapsack, and tie a rope around it. And he would tell one of the other herdsmen to stay with the sheep to stay back, and that shepherd would go up to the next field that the sheep were going to go and graze in. And if it had high grass, you know what was one of the biggest enemies to sheep? Vipers. Apart from lions. But vipers, uh, vipers could attack sheep, especially if they smell blood. And you know what that shepherd would do? He'd go up to the field where not, before the sheep ever get there, and he'd throw out that knapsack when that blood of that lamb's been leaking through that knapsack, and it's covered, and he'd walk with a rope, Leave the rope 20 feet behind him and he'd walk through that field. He'd walk through that field and what he'd do is he'd just make a couple of traces, a couple of rounds through it. And they said sometimes, and what you'd hear is you'd hear, sss, sss, sss. They said some shepherds sometimes would get up to 10, 15 vipers on that bag. Going after sheep blood. What he's doing is he's preparing that field for the next group of sheep to come through. Uh, let me say this, I want, I want to move on, but folks... I don't want to be viper bait. And I know a lot of Christians where they, they refuse to get right. They refuse to do what God wanted them to do. They just took a comfort and they took ease in Zion. And God said, I can't have you around anymore. I have to make an example of you. And I don't want to be God's example. I want to be a good example. But the point is, I don't want to be viper bait. And so that's the, that he's preparing a table for the other ones. Sheep are defenseless. They get hurt easily. They get, you know sheep, you know where they uh, uh, get the most damage from? is in the fold. Sheep get hurt the most from other sheep. They get hurt the most. They're either bitten or kicked by other sheep. And you want to know why? It's usually whenever the other sheep are playing around. You know whenever you're playing around in church and you're being carnal, you're going to hurt somebody? They are never cruelly or brutally hurt by the shepherd, but they may begin to doubt the shepherd and they may begin to walk away. They may begin to wonder themselves because they're doubting that the shepherd's going to be able to take care of them. They've been hurt, so now they're starting to doubt the shepherd. And they go away from the flock. The shepherd won't protect you from every uh, carnal uh, sheep. He won't protect you. Sheep hurt sheep. If you begin to leave the flock because of pain uh, and hurt, there's, so much, there's a greater enemy outside the flock that'll hurt you. That sheep that we read here in this verse, he was left in bits and pieces. And that's how sin will leave you. That's how sin will leave you in bits and pieces. You know, we talk about it all the time, but we were driving through, man. Uh, we were driving through today, and uh, the sister said, she didn't mean anything by it, but uh, she was joking. She goes, man, I wish we could have showed you a better part of uh, California. <laughs> the, the, the way they took us there is, uh, I looked down over top of the freeway, and in Columbus, if you're homeless, you've got to stay away back in the, in the trees or something, at least, or by the railroad tracks. You can't just be out in the middle of the, you know, the, middle of the intersection there. And I saw those tents, I was like, are they allowed to be out there? And I, cause I forgot, I've heard the stories about it out here. But, um, and they go, yeah. Then they started telling me about another place, uh, what was it called? Skid Row. Skid Row and Tender District, or something, I forget what it was. Tenderloin District, yeah. And uh, we were dry, so we were just talking about it, and I started, I mean, I was just looking, thinking about it. They were telling me other stuff, other stories of demonic houses that they all went to and everything else. But. <laughs> and then we drove, we, what, the way it took us was there was, a, they took us, and it was just a random spot, just houses and everything, businesses, and all of a sudden you've seen 15, 20 tents yeah. sitting there. Yeah. You say, Aaron, what's that? That's a bunch of bits and pieces. You know, it's not, that, it's not this bad as it is here. It's not that bad in Columbus, but it's bad in Columbus. I remember when I first got to Charity Mission there, Amazing Grace Baptist Church, I remember watching, having parking lot duty. I was only been there a couple of months, and I remember looking across the alleyway, or across the street to the alleyway, there's a picket fence. I'll never forget the day that I saw a, a flash and heard a big bang. Heard somebody take off running during Sunday school, and Goldie was shot. 
I'll never forget the day that I was getting ready to go work out uh, at the, my, the pastor has a gym there in his, uh, in, in his, uh, in his garage, and I was going to go run on the treadmill there, and uh, I see this stuff all the time. I see people overdosing all the time. They literally knock on my door. I've had people get pistol whipped in the dope house, come knock on my door, and I clean them up. I give them uh, food and water. I, 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 I witness to them. I try to help them. I, I, on Easter, I, I would have, there'd be prostitutes out there on the street outside of the church. It's an inner city church. And the, the prostitutes on Easter, I remember Easter morning, I was sitting in my car getting ready for service, man. A prostitute walks up to my door, and, uh, and it's, just, I, it's just how it is, man. I remember when I was getting ready to go to that gym there and work out, and I looked uh, beside me there right on the other side of the church, there was a man and woman with a needle in this. Uh, the one had a needle uh, right there in his hand. And I remember I kept on driving. I didn't stop. I kept going to work out. I remember the Holy Ghost there in that car said, Aaron, what are you doing? And he said, you're not going to stop? And I said, no, Lord, I, I see that all the time. I, what can I do about it? If I call the cops, they're probably not going to come because i got so much other stuff going on. And I remember the Lord said, man, you're some, you're some Christian. I can't wait till next time you get up to preach on your own. But I'm not going to be with you. And I remember, man, I drove back there and I, I, I turned around, turned the car around. And I, I drove back there and they, they were already, they already had it shot up and they were zoning out and I remember getting down there saying, look, I don't know how high you are, I don't know how far gone you are, but I want you to know this, I want you to know that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Uh, if you ask Him to forgive you of your sins, He'll save your soul right now, you can do that. And I remember I left them the tracks there to the church, and, and they just passed out, and they were gone when I came back later, but I'm talking about bits and pieces. And you know, you have a whole state that's just in bits and pieces. I look around, man, at some of our churches, man, that are in bits and pieces. Families that are in bits and pieces. The husbands that come to church without their wives. Wives that come to church without their husbands. Pastors that have kids that are going wayward. Uh, uh, husbands that have just everything, man. Kids that come to church without their parents. I'm, I'm, talking, all, I'm talking about bits and pieces. Our, our families are in bits and pieces. People are in bits and pieces. Churches are in bits and pieces. And that's Amos' message on sin. That's what he tells them. He says, hey, God's judgment's here. It's coming. He said, you've been living a life of ease. And he says, just as a shepherd delivers the she uh, sheep out of the mouth of the lion with two legs or a piece of an ear, they were left in bits and pieces. That's the message on sin. But I want you to get this. That's the message on sin. I want you to notice the message on sin. But notice number two, the mentality of the shepherd. The mentality of the shepherd. You say, what do you mean? All that's left of that little sheep is two legs and a piece of an ear. It's not very much, is it? But you know what the shepherd did? He went after it. The shepherd went after it. He didn't look there at that sheep and he didn't say, man, that looks like there's too much going on. I can't fight that lion. It's too big of an enemy. He didn't look at that sheep and say, man, it's pretty much done away with. I can't get anything out of it. It's not going to bring me any money. It's not going to bring me any glory. I can't sell it. It's not going to reproduce. It's not going to do anything for me. Man, that sheep is dead. And you know what that shepherd did? He said, I'm going to give my life for that sheep. You know what God did for you one day? God looked at you and He saw how you were wrecked by sin, how you were wrecked by the devil, how you were wrecked by this world, and He didn't look at your enemy and say, man, that enemy's too big, that enemy's too great. He didn't look at you and say, man, there ain't nothing left with Him that I can do anything with. Hey, He saw something with just some bits and pieces. He saw something that He could work with with just some bits and pieces. You and I may have uh, let that sheep just go, but the shepherd said, no, there's still something there worth fighting for. And folks, there's still something in California worth fighting for. Amen. There's still something in our local churches that's worth fighting for. Amen. Although there's not much left, the, the, the shepherd still went out after it. It's a, good, it's a good little teaching on eternal security. The devil sure can't take a whole lot, but he can't take all the sheep. He may get you down to just a leg or an ear or so, but he ain't going to take all of you. The shepherd's mentality was they still have some of an ear to hear me and legs to walk back to me. And if you're here today and God's speaking to your heart, you can come back to the shepherd. And if you have a loved one that you're praying for that you think is in the mouth of the devil, it's in the mouth of the lion, hey, if they're still breathing, there's still hope. 
The shepherd's mentality was that if I save this sheep, I don't know, I'm just thinking, what was the shepherd thinking? I'm wondering if this shepherd was thinking, man, if I save this sheep, surely whenever I bring it back to the fold and I heal it, I bet you that sheep's never going to want to leave my side. I bet you that sheep's going to be so thankful for what I did for it. And folks, you know what God lets you and I do sometimes? He lets us wander. He lets the devil take bites out of us. He lets our flesh take bites out of us. He lets pain, misery, and woe take bites out of us. Why? So He can come and deliver us and hope that you and I would stay thankful to Him and not leave us side. 2 Timothy 4. Turn over to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I know you've heard a lot in this text. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm trying to bring it down. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. The shepherd's mentality was, I'll give everything and anything to save that sheep. God gave everything, His Son Jesus Christ, on Calvary to save your and I's soul. The shepherd went to where the lion was, met him there, and took the, took, defended the sheep, took the sheep out of his uh, mouth. Look there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know what's going on. Paul here is at the end of his life. He's older physically. He's in pain. Vision's gone. He probably has broken bones. He probably has a sore back, sore legs from being stoned to death and everything else. His friends have forsaken him or died, been martyred. His ministry's in pieces. All the churches are gone. Pastors he trained, for the most part, most of them are gone. He says in one thing that, or one book there that all those that are in Asia have forsaken me. He's writing a letter to a young pastor while he's in prison talking about the people that have fallen out and the churches that have fallen out. And look at this, verse number 16. He said, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may be not laid to their charge. Man, talk about grace. Notwithstanding the Lord, Paul's life's in bits and pieces. His ministry's in bits and pieces. He's getting ready to literally be in pieces. He's getting ready to be beheaded. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that, I, that by me the preaching that might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered Amen. out of the mouth of the lion. Amen. When all hope is gone, whenever your life's in bits and pieces, whenever someone's life is in bits and pieces, the good shepherd steps out, steps in and takes care of the job and goes after that sheep that's gone. I want to give you these stories... Uh, quickly and I'll, I'll be done, but I'm talking about bits and pieces. I'm talking about what God's mentality is. Folks, listen, if you don't get this, get, if you don't get anything else, get this. A lot of times as Bible believers, we love that message on sin. We love delivering it to people. We love telling them that they're going to burn in hell. We love telling them that God's judgment is righteous. We love, we love preaching those things. We love giving those things. But don't you ever take the message of sin and forget the mentality of the shepherd. We've got a lot of people, man, that they can tell you a message on sin, but do they have the mentality of the shepherd? Uh, my father, uh, I want to tell you the story real quick here. Uh, my father, he's been in the ministry now for 43, 44 years almost, and uh, he got saved back in the 70s, and uh, his mom and dad never did get saved. Uh, for 40-some years, he's been going around to churches telling people to pray for James and Mary Cole if they'd be saved. And uh, they never have been saved, and uh, they... Uh, they were down there in Florida, and long story short, he couldn't come out here. My father couldn't to California last January because uh, he had COVID. And uh, he actually ended up, uh, my grandfather ended up getting COVID. And um, I, don't care what you, I don't care what you think about COVID. I don't care if you think that it's a cold or flu. I don't care if you are so scared of it you drink Germex in the morning. I don't care what you think about it. Uh, uh, but my, my point is this. My grandfather died. You can say, well, Aaron, he died of complications of the COVID. Okay, whatever. He died. He died. He died. Um, he died back, he died, uh, I believe it was January 14th, maybe. And, uh, but he was in the hospital there. We got the call that he, he's in there and he's not doing too good. And long story short, on, on January 10th, on Sunday, I taught Sunday school. My father preached a morning service. And in the afternoon, I was sitting there in my car. My sister said, can you give me a call? And she gave me a call and she told me the story. And she gave me the number of this lady so I could call and verify the story. What happened was this. My sisters, and this is going to be confusing, but it's supposed to. My, I'm going somewhere with it. My sister's husband told his mom to pray for James Kogel. My sister's brother's mom went and told a co-worker to pray for James Kogel. He's in a hospital down in Florida. 
That coworker went to her church, Rubyville Community Church there in southern Ohio, and told them to put on their prayer train that uh, James Kogel was in a hospital in, in Florida. Please, please pray for him. The lady, Jamie, and uh, her husband, Bruce Bacon Haster, they are in charge of the prayer chain. I believe they're in Rubyville, and they have a ministry. Their ministry is they go into hospitals and try to win people to the Lord that are getting ready to die. And if they can't get there, they call. Now keep this in mind, folks. None of us know this lady, Jamie. Never talked to her a day in our life. She goes to a community church. They believe in salvation by grace through faith. Uh, we don't know her. We didn't tell any of this to her. We didn't tell her to do this or anything like that. We also, ourselves, my own father didn't even know what floor my grand, his dad was on, what, what floor my grandfather was on. He didn't know. We didn't know. Um, at 7 a.m., Jamie calls on Sunday morning, calls that hospital, finds out where my grandfather is. And calls that floor and says, I'd like to speak with James uh, Kogel. And they said, sorry, he's asleep, he's not awake, can you call back? She calls back again at 8 a.m. And uh, they say, we're in the middle of a nurse change, could you call back later? Keep in mind, he's on a ventilator, so they have him out, they have him sedated often. Whenever he wakes up, he begins getting anxious, wanting to pull the tubes, he's breathing heavy, so they sedate him again. Uh, at 8 o'clock she calls, so she just goes to Sunday school. And uh, she goes to Sunday school, and then in between Sunday school and morning service... She was going to wait until after the morning service, but she said the Holy Ghost told her, no, go call now in between services. And she goes to call, and a man answers, a nurse, it's a male nurse named Scott. She says, Scott, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I want to witness to James Kogel. I believe he's going to die soon. I want to be able to witness to him, give him the gospel. And he says, well, he said, you're in luck. He said, I'm a Christian. And he said, we're not allowed to take our phones into this room because he's COVID positive. He's still infected. He said, but I can take my cell phone in there. Between around 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 a.m., she called at 10.30. Th those two hours, those were the last two hours my grandfather was conscious and awake. And she said, uh, James, she said, you don't know me. She said, my name is Jamie. And uh, he, put, he went in there and he put it on speakerphone. He was awake there breathing through that ventilator. That ventilator and that tube was going, everything was going up and down and tubes down his throat and IVs and everything else hooked up to him. And she said, James, I don't know a lot about you. I don't know your past, your history, but I know this, James. She said, uh, you're looking, you're probably going to die soon. And she goes, James, you need to be saved. And she said, James, uh, she went through the gospel. And I made sure with her. I said, Are you, you believe in salvation by grace through faith? She goes, yeah. I go, you don't believe in water baptism? She goes, no. I go, you don't believe in speaking in tongues? She goes, no. I go, you don't believe you got to have a feeling going up your right leg and then back down your left leg and then back and forth? She goes, no. I asked her, I did, I want to make sure. Uh, she goes, James, I'm going to give you the opportunity to accept or reject Jesus Christ right now. And she began to pray and said, James, you can pray this prayer with me. She began to pray, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe that uh, it, he was buried and rose again the third day, and if he... Lord, I'm asking Jesus Christ, forgive me of my sins, come into my heart and save my soul. Just a sinner's prayer, just a simple sinner's prayer. And she asked the nurse, because there's no noise, she asked the nurse, she said, what happened? And he goes, while you were praying, she would pause in between, he goes, while you were praying, he goes, he would move his mouth. And she said, well, I don't want to give them false hope. She goes, did, did anything else happen? And he goes, he's crying right now. And she said, well, are you, are you sure he did it? And Scott goes, he's smiling now. <laughs> That's the last time he's awake, man. He went home to be with the Lord and four days later. My grandma, she has dementia and she isn't saved either. And, uh, my, my father went down there back in March to uh, be with her. and She's so bad, gone, so far gone. I'm talking about being in bits and pieces. I'm talking about there being no hope left. I'm talking about you've prayed, man, for 40-some years. You've prayed. You, you, you've prayed for that person to get saved, and it seems like there's no hope. That's what I'm talking about right now. She has dementia. She was so bad off. This is how bad off she is, that the day that he was found, uh, my, my aunt calls her and says, uh, calls and my grandma picks up, and that's unnormal, because no, that, that's ir irregular, because normally it's my grandfather that answers the phone. She goes, hey, Mom, what's going on? She goes, oh, good. She goes, where's Dad at? And she goes, oh, he's just laying over on the floor. And she goes, laying on the floor? What's he doing on the floor? And my grandma goes, I don't know. He's been there all morning. And she goes, well, Mom, does he need anything? And she goes, I don't know. He just keeps mum uh, mumbling under his breath. And she goes, Mom, go see if he needs help. 
And my grandma goes over and goes, Jim, Jim, get up. Jim, get up. No response. She goes, he didn't say anything. And she goes, Mom, I'm, I'm on my way now. I want to call the, the EMS. And she calls the ambulance. The ambulance comes and gets him. That's how far gone my grandma is. So I've been praying, God, could you roll back those clouds for just a little while? Could you take those clouds, man, just roll it back just long enough for her to get the gospel and that she's a sinner? And God, God, if she's so far gone, is she, is she out of hope? God, is there no hope for her? I said, God, can you just roll back those clouds? Man, I've been praying. I've been fasting. And, and uh, so have other people, man, for years and years. And he was talking to her one night on the, on the couch. And he said, Mom, he said, he said, you need to be saved. And he's told us before, he said, Mom, he said, if you don't get saved, he, she, he goes, you're never going to see James. You're never going to see your husband. He said, Mom, you're not going to see me in heaven. You're not going to see Tony. You're not going to see Aaron. You're not going to see the kids, Mom. We're saved, and you never asked Jesus Christ to save you, Mom. And I'm scared you're going to wait too long. And she said, she, they went back and forth. And, and finally she said this, Brother Jean, she said, she said, well, what do I need to be saved from? He said, Mom, you're a sinner. And she goes, I just don't believe I've sinned. They went back and forth. And finally she said this. She goes, well, she goes, I guess I'll, I guess I'll just go ahead and get saved. And he went and nailed. He went and knelt down beside her and led her to the Lord. He said they talked for another hour. He said that that next morning, man. He said he went into the room. He said, "Mom, I got to leave and go to the airport." And uh, he said he looked down at her, man. He said it was just a different woman. He said went over and kissed her on the head. Said, "Mom, I love you." And he left, man. And man, I'm talking about whenever everything seems gone, whenever everything seems hopeless, God still goes after the sheep. And you're saying, what does this have to do with California? What does it have to do with those things? You know there are other people out there right now that are in bits and pieces. And you know what they need? They need somebody that's going to go after them. Somebody that's willing to say, I'm going to go and fight for whatever's left of it. I'm going to go and fight for whatever's left of our churches, for whatever's left of our communities. I'm going to go and fight. I'm asking you this evening, who's going to go? Who's going to go? Are you waiting around on somebody else to go? Are you, are you just waiting on your... You want to sit there and keep eating from your pastor, man? Keep eating from your pastor and never go and feed somebody else? What does God have to do to you, man, to wake you up? I hope you don't have to do what He did to me. When are you going to step out? When are you going to go find you a sheep, man, that's got nothing left in him and put some time into him, put some energy into him? You know what they said about William Booth, man? They were going to give him a big old church. And I, I, I got to tell you all, my, my burden, man, I'm college educated. I'll, be a, I'll have a doctorate in a couple months, man. I know all that stuff. I, I, I know the education system. I know how to talk the lingo. I know all those things, man. But God's put something inside of my heart, man, for the down and outers. The ones that nobody else wants in their church, the ones that everybody else has given up on, man, that's where my burden is. They said they offered William Booth a great church there in London. They said, William, we're going to put you in this parsonage about his ordination. And he went up to that platform and he said, I cannot go. He said, I'm going to go to the ghettos, to the slums, and preach to him. They said at his funeral he had thousands of, of, of hoodlums, of drunks, of gangsters, of prostitutes come to his funeral. And they said whenever he stood up there and said, I can't, he said, I can't go to that church. He said, I have to go to where God's called me. They said they heard from the rafters a little female voice. And she said... Grab your Bible, William. I'll go with you. Amen. It was his wife. Amen. How about it, ladies? Come on, preacher. You want to go with your husband? You want to go the extra mile, man? You're willing to go to Bible school to leave your house, to leave your home, to leave your hopes? Will you go? Will you go? Who will go? Who will go for me? I'm talking about bits and pieces tonight. I'm glad you have the message on sin, but don't you ever forget the mentality of the shepherd. Dear Lord, we love you, and thank you, God, for loving us. God, my heart is heavy. Lord, I wasted time. Lord, I wasted years of my life. God, I could have been doing more for you. God, I could have been saving more. Lord, people reaching more, God. But Lord, you've called me now. Lord, you've forgiven me, God. You've saved me out of the mouth of a lion. And God, I thank you for that, God. But Lord, I pray, Lord, that no one in here tonight, God, would have to get that far to wake up. And no one would have to get that far, God, to come back to the shepherd, to come back to the fold. 
And God, I pray maybe tonight there'd be some young man or a young woman, God, somebody that's clean, somebody that's pure, somebody that's undefiled. And they'd go now. God, they'd be willing to give up home, to give up land. God, to go and find a lost sheep. It's been abused by this world. It's been a tormented, God, by sin. And God, they'd go and deliver them, Lord, out of the mouth of the lion. God, we've developed a Christianity, Lord, that's so practical, it's so planned out, God, that everything has to line up. And God, you left all of heaven, Lord. You left everything, God, to come down here and save a bunch of lost sheep whose lives were in bits and pieces, God. And you saw something in us, God, that maybe we didn't see in ourselves. But God, you saw there was still something there worth fighting for. There's something there worth dying for, God. There's something still a life to build, God, with what was left. And God, I pray, Lord, tonight or this evening, God, you'd build a life, Lord, and, and somebody's uh, life, God, you'd do something, Lord, with them tonight. And God, that they'd be willing to go. I love you, Lord. And God, I pray you'd bless the invitation, bless the altar call, Lord. And God, may no one leave here, God, with business that's left unattended. God, may no one leave here, God, uh, fighting and resisting the Holy Ghost, God, that no one would leave here, God, without answering, Lord, the call in their life, Father. God, touch them, Lord. God, help them, I pray. In Jesus Christ's name, and amen.